man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. All right. Welcome back, family. Hope you guys are doing great. Before I start <laughs> going into all the things, because this is going to be a rapid summary, pretty much of all the things we've already talked about, I want to encourage anyone who you're, you're either on one side of the fence or the other with this. Actually, I say that. However, there are some people who don't even know <laughs> that there's a fence. They think, you know, what is this little season? What is this whole thing? So whichever side of the fence you're on, pray, you know, seek truth on this. And I have a lot of people telling me that you just need to keep seeking. And so that's what we're doing here. This is a journey. We're in this together. And uh, we got to share love because I'm, I'm already seeing that there's a lot of hate. And it's, it's really tough to see that uh, because it's people that at one point, we were all pretty unified, and now it's like uh, just I don't, it's it's a darkness that kind of just moves over when that when that uh, spirit of debate comes into the mix. We have to really be humble, share things. I'm I'm really looking into this. A lot of people are looking into this, so just I encourage you all ask the Father to show you the truth. And something I was thinking about earlier as part of my testimony uh, when I was asking the Father to show me the truth about everything, I remember knowing, having this feeling, he's trying to show me something. I don't know what it is. I'm going outside. I'm finally seeking and I'm looking up at the sky and I'm saying, show me the truth. What, what are you trying to show me? I can feel it. You're trying to show me something. What is it? And I didn't see it for a couple of days and it was really grieving me when I wasn't seeing the truth of what he was trying to show me. I didn't know what it was. I knew it was something big. And finally, one day I just said, Father, I'm ready. You know, I had to say, I'm ready. Uh, show me the truth. No matter how crazy it sounds, I'm ready. And be careful because that is dangerous. When I said that, that's when that was right after that, when he showed me the truth about biblical earth creation. And it's been quite the journey ever since. And I told him I was ready. And I remember when I found out it was like I was blown back in my chair. I was like, am I really <laughs> was I really ready uh, for how powerful his truth really is? And 
how crafty the enemy can be to lie and deceive. And I think that's what a lot of this is about. People on both sides saying we're being deceived. And when you hear about the little season and the devil going and deceiving, you think I can relate to that. And so I'm not angry at anybody that believes that we're in the little season. And so um, I'm just really hoping to sort things out, look at prophecy, look at the words of Yeshua and just dive pretty deep into this because every time I look at it and we have these little hangouts, people are saying you need to look into the mud floods. You need to look into Tartaria. And so I've been doing that and it's bringing about some weird stuff. And I I know uh, fascinating stuff, but also challenging me to go back to certain verses as well that you guys are sharing. So if you have yet to ever look into this topic, again, this is going to be a fast summary. I, um, for those of you who have seen part one and part two, or I guess our first ever Wordaholics Anonymous live word studies, this was a topic I thought that was important to study. So I wanted to do it first with these. And again, I'm hoping to do these every week. However, some weeks I can't. Like last week, we took last week off after th- three weeks in a row. Uh, but it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing to me to uh, go through these things with you guys and to have your feedback. So I hope it's a blessing for you all as well. And again, I ask that you guys pray, no matter what side you're on, that if I'm wrong, the Father shows it to you. If there's something I'm missing, that you can show it to me. And uh, and it's not about head knowledge. It's like that uh, verse of the, the day on Bible Gateway. I was on there this morning, or actually not this morning, this evening. And um, let me pull that up real quick so I can read that. I believe it was 1 Corinthians 13. Let me click that. Um, 13. Yeah, 13. Right at the very beginning. um, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that word charity is love, and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And so that's what it's about. It's not about my head knowledge, me knowing everything, you guys knowing everything. It's about love. So we can have all those things. And without love, it means absolutely nothing. People are not going to be brought to the Father by your head knowledge. It's rare. I don't think I've ever seen people go, man, did you see his head knowledge? (laughs) That's the Father I want to follow. You know, they they see your love in your comments, even if it's a comment, you might think it's just a comment on YouTube or Facebook. It has a a ripple effect. So remember that. uh, And speaking of that, thank you moderators out there who are working for us diligently doing these things. As we have these hangouts, there's people that are going to come in and attack. And so I thank you guys. I see you in the, in the chat already. Tyler Porter, country dad, uh, Chiron, Dennis and Debbie, Mark Merritt, Lots of you awesome people out there already joining in. And so thank you. Thank you for your your work, our supporters. We thank you for all your support, giving us some uh, awesome people to fellowship with as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started again. There's over 100 slides. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes on each of them. It's going to be fast. This is a summary and as well as some new things we've seen since our last studies. But most importantly, it is a a rapid summary to kind of solidify some of the things we were saying, but also to look at a lot of things that you guys are seeing as well. And so um, hopefully it makes a lot more sense for anyone who is confused whatsoever. So here we go. Let me remove or actually full screen the presentation. Okay, so are we in Satan's little season? What is it? quick little rundown, has to do with the evil one first being bound, they call the dragon or the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, being bound for a thousand years. Okay, so that's going to happen first. And then it says at the very end, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So him being loosed after the thousand years after he's gone a thousand years without deceiving the nations. 
Because remember, there's a binding up and a throwing into this bottomless pit. But also, the others are burned. The false prophets and everything, they're burned up. So we have the evil one being bound. There's a thousand years where there's no deceptions. And it goes on in Revelation 20 to say, or verse 4, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So that mark of the beast and all of that already happens before that millennial reign. And then it says, but the rest of the dead lived not again, because people are going to die on this day. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. There's going to be another one. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. So they are going to be immortal at that point. And it says, but they shall be priests of Yah and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there's a reign going on. That's why it's called the millennial reign. Reigning with the beloved son who has just returned with the father. Enemies being bound. All these things happening. And so... The quick glimpse into what the purpose of for that little season, there's a purpose, a very specific purpose. And it says here, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So there's a gathering together to battle. This is Revelation 20. In Revelation 16, there's also a gathering together to battle. We'll look at that. There's two battles, essentially. And so which one we're in, that'll depend on a lot of things. And so both of them, though, they do require battling. Who else? The beloved son, the father, all of the saints. Like That's the little season purpose right here. And so it says, The number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and they went upon the breadth of the earth, and compass the camp of the saints about. Why? Because the camp of the saints is here. So in that territory where they gather, they're able to go and march up towards the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And then it says, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So no matter which side you're on, that event hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. I haven't had the fire raining down from heaven Okay, so the entire purpose, here's a visual, attack the camp of the saints that's out there near Armageddon, which is a place owned by, guess who, United Nations, and we'll look at that. And so you have these two battle scenarios that we've covered and put side by side. Revelation 16, where you have the unclean spirits like frogs, or the spirits of devils, working miracles going forth unto the kings of the earth. This is pre-millennial reign, for anyone that's confused. This is before that thousand-year period. How do we know it's before? Because there's kings of the earth. The prophecies tell us that during the thousand-year reign, there's not going to be any more kings of the earth. That's why in Revelation chapter 20, it tells us they're going to deceive, or he, Satan, shall be loosed to deceive the nations. So one is deceiving kings. One is deceiving nations. One has to do with unclean spirits. The other has to do with Satan. Okay, right now we have kings of the earth, and we obviously have a lot of unclean spirits at work. So there's a lot going on right now with spiritual warfare. Like they say, we're battling those principalities and powers of darkness. Okay, so again, I'm not going to go over everything in uh, detail. These slides are still here, and they're in our first studies. But gathering to that place, Armageddon, the threat this time will be above. And remember the final card, where's that alien threat coming from? It's coming from above. What are we seeing in the news? Oh, man, there's these UFOs above us. There's this threat. we got to be unified. Is it dangerous? Ooh, we don't know. It's mysterious. So mysterious. we got to put it in the news all the time. Okay? They're planning something. Von Braun, before he died, said, hey, that final card they're going to play is that extraterrestrial threat, that threat from above. Okay, this was coming from a guy who was high level, who knew what was going on. And he was confessing on his deathbed that it's that final card, that extraterrestrial threat. Okay, so you have a power coming from above. 
It's in all of our movies, the the great villains, the bad guys, the Thors and Thanos or whatever, not Thor. Thanos is always up in this kingdom above looking down, the bad guy that can just wipe everything out of existence. And so that's Revelation 16. You have a lot of things happening in Revelation 16. One of them I didn't really cover a lot in the last videos, and that's the Euphrates River drying up. Again, the Euphrates River drying up, this is pre-millennial rain. It's still there right now, but you look at news articles, they say it's drying up. And um, I took this one off of that website that's always kind of slandering the Bible, but it says here, um, why is the Euphrates River drying up and what does it mean? Well, the Bible suggested this means the rapture is coming, but water wars might be a more earthly problem. Just as the Bible warned, the Euphrates River is drying up. However, unlike supernatural explanations like the second coming of Jesus Christ, there is a very real environmental phenomenon driving this problem. Yeah, let's ignore prophecy, guys. It's just an environmental phenomenon. Yeah. Ignore the fact that your word is coming true. It says chronic droughts and climate change, although once a fruitful land, the Tigris-Euphrates River system is now drying up at a startling rate. Imagine that. A government report by the Iraqi Ministry of Water Resources in 2021 warned that the rivers could run dry by 2040. My predictions, it will be much sooner than that due to the declining water levels and droughts driven by, guess what, global climate change. So there's that. And speaking of unclean spirits like frogs, we talked about this. They just resurrected a extinct species of frog that give birth to live young through their mouth literally frogs coming out of the mouth of other frogs, which just I thought was almost like uh, not funny, but like very telling of the times we're in. We're like, why would you do that now? Now that we're in this time of literally the unclean spirits like frogs deceiving people and then coming out of the mouth, like it says in Revelation of the beast and the false prophets. So pretty interesting that that's happened. That was just like a little side note, um, but still pretty interesting. And so Armageddon, premillennial, that battle where we see this place called Armageddon mentioned, but it has a different name. Sometimes it's Megiddo um, or Harmageddon, Mount Megiddo, just depends. So it's hard to find. You can't just type in Armageddon and find it because remember the Old Testament was from Hebrew translations. The New Testament was from Greek and it changes things. So it's hard to find things going from old to new, new to old or whatever. So it's mentioned in Joshua twice and it's also mentioned in judges so you guys can go back and read that but this place here is owned like i said by unesco which is of the united nations they're going to be uniting kings of the earth about to see something interesting about that um so speaking of that i want to share a little video uh clip real quick that has to do with this and i don't know if you've heard of it it's an operation where it sounds like they're rehearsing the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, so you got to have a rehearsal uh, before you do stuff. The enemy's got to practice. They got to pretty almost seems like they have to show you what they're going to do before they do it. Kind of like event 201. I don't want to say it the way it is because I'm I just had a video deleted, an old video for medical misinformation. So I don't want to speak about certain events and certain things, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, with that event that they had a rehearsal of a certain thing where everything shut down right after they had their little rehearsal. Um, most of you know what I'm talking about. Again, I don't want to get flagged here. And so I'm going to show you this Operation Steadfast Defender where uh, NATO is uniting and they're going to have this giant drill to practice attacking a what they call a near peer threat. So just check this out. It's a short little video. Steadfast Defender 24 will be a clear demonstration of our unity, our strength, and our determination to protect each other, to protect, of course, our values and the rules-based international order. The rules-based international order. With participation from approximately 90,000 forces from all 31 allies, plus our good partner, Sweden. The Alliance will demonstrate its ability to reinforce the Euro-Atlantic area, by a transatlantic movement of forces from North America. This reinforcement will occur during a simulated emerging conflict scenario against a near peer adversary. Against a near peer adversary. You got the as above, so below symbols, the NATO. 
they got it going one way and then the other at the end. Near peer adversary. Yeah, they're going to try to go near the millennial kingdom and unite everybody um, when that happens. And they're going to try to unite everybody where they know the beloved son and the father are going to come down because prophecies tell us where they're going to come down. They know where this threat's going to be. It's going to be up above. And so they're preparing us for this extraterrestrial threat, the final threat. Okay, that battle of Armageddon. And so UNESCO, again, this is something I shared before. They own a lot of these structures, these old Babylonian uh, ruins, pyramids of Giza, Jesuit places. Jesuits play a big role in shaping our history. They even uh, are involved with changing the name Tartaria. I found that out. That, <laughs> that got my interest up a little bit, um, erasing that kingdom. So, yeah, it's 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 quite interesting the things that these united nations do and the things they own. There's far more. There's hundreds of things they own. And it's usually significant places and that things that have ties to pagan worship and all of that. They own them. They, they're sacred to them, too. And so Armageddon or Armageddon is right here. And uh, on the map, you can see where it's at. That's important when you look at what we just saw with UNESCO, because what they were saying was regards to this entire area. When you look at significant wars and events happening, a lot of them are in this region. And so, it, 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 again, it, to me, it just feels like they're practicing what they're going to do. And so that steadfast defender, you saw the video. This kind of summarizes a lot of that so you can see what it talks about. But that word steadfast, it reminds me of uh, some verses in the Bible. And again, this word's hard to find. I'm like looking up these verses. They spell steadfast differently in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I'm like, man, where's all these verses? What's going on here? You just have to spell it slightly differently. It um, has an A in the New Testament, and there's no A after the E in the Old Testament. And so uh, 2 Peter 3, it says, Therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, you beware, lest you should fall from thy or thee own steadfastness, having been led away by the error of lawlessness. Think about that. Being steadfast, not being led away by lawlessness. That's what's going on right now. The rise of this lawlessness, the lawless one, the son of perdition, that's going to be claiming he is the most high. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And so that's what the steadfastness is about. And um, Daniel, it even talks about steadfast. It says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed the one they're going to try to destroy after the millennial reign and his dominion shall be even unto the end so steadfastness they're taking that play on word straight from the word itself and when you look at that area that euro atlantic area i typed that into google and that's what it pulled up it could uh entail of more territories but I found it fascinating that they are right there next to Armageddon. These areas that they are trying to defend, that to defend that Euro-Atlantic area, that near peer threat. It's going to be somewhere near there. Yeah, Armageddon, buddy. <laughs> you better believe it. That's what they are planning. So fascinating stuff. Just looking at the numbers, you know, it says as the sand of the sea, all these people, 90,000 personnel. This is the biggest thing, the biggest drill since they said the Cold War. So back in the 80s, I think is what they said. So 90,000, you know, it's 31 allies. I found that interesting. It's not 32, but oh, they got Sweden. There's 32. And I'm sure somebody will join making it 33 here pretty soon. You can bet that'll probably happen with all the things they're doing. So yeah, just all these naval assets to make people think that they can defend themselves against this threat coming from above that they cannot defend themselves against. It's the most high and his beloved son. You don't have a chance, uh, but they think they do. Or actually, I don't even think they think they do. They want to lead you into thinking that you do and watching you be destroyed is their goal. Pretty much with every battle. And again, there's their logo. I thought I saw a swastika in there somewhere. Even though that thing predates Nazi Germany, they, they have that uh, thing. It's written out forward and backwards. I just found that significant and interesting. They would do that. And so that is that is the Armageddon. That's the battle of the fort of the... Um, or I guess the preparation of battle against a threat from above. 
And then Revelation 20, you have the threat on the ground. This is after the thousand years are over. And it tells us that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, after the thousand years are over, the adversary will be set free from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, like we read earlier, to gather them for the battle. Okay, so this is that battle that's going to happen after the thousand year reign. The kingdom is there. These people have had a thousand years of peace on the earth. There hasn't been any war. The father has been the only king. There are no kings. There's nations. There's not kings. There are nations. And so that's why they are here deceiving the nations. And so the devil in this prophecy doesn't destroy the villages outside of the camps of the saints and destroy the world and cause a biblical proportion flood. Um, According to Revelation 20, I mean, I could be adding to the word to say that those things happen, that they flood the world uh, with mud and everything and hide all these structures and hide that kingdom. Um, but sounds like he's just going and trying to make good friends with everybody and getting them to join his side. This lawless one that wants you to go, hey, there's there's no rules if you join us. We're going to def defy this being that's trying to give you rules all this time. You know, you guys have been in harmony. There's no taxes. Your your food is free. You're growing all your own food for free. It's prospering. You're keeping the Father's laws, like it says. His laws going forth from Zion, like it says in prophecy. Things are going to be done the right way. We wonder why we're struggling now to have food with the nutrients it used to have. We're not letting the soil rest. We're not doing things the right way. And so at this time period, though, people are probably going to be spoiled. Things are going to be fairly easy. Um, but I don't know what's going to be going on. There may be droughts happening kind of like with the prophet Elijah, however, there was a drought because people were being disobedient. They might start being disobedient once he's let loose, start missing some of the Feast of Tabernacles. And like it says, then there's going to be droughts. And so if the evil one could get them to miss the things they're supposed to do, and then there's droughts in the land, people are going to be mad at the Most High. They're not going to realize it's their own errors. And that could cause them to want to unite and fight against him. Okay, these plagues, plagues usually drive people to want to fight. It's like, hey, I'm being tormented. I want to torment somebody. Then the evil one's going to say, let's just direct your anger this direction. Threats on the ground, and let's go that way. We can end this all right now. So um, interesting stuff. That's my take on it. Again, side by side, Revelation 16, threats coming from above. Revelation 20, post-millennial reign, little season, what a lot of people think we're in now. The millennial kingdom's already there, and they're trying to get us to attack it. Just They're going to be deceiving the nations. There's no kings. And so here comes something fascinating. You may have seen it if you watch the intro. Um, the punishments, one of those is hailstones. And I just pictured little, you know, hailstones about like what we get when they're really massive um, for Revelation 16. And then fire coming from above. Um, you can see that, that you know, that's just something you can imagine. I, I can't even fathom fire coming from above uh, to the degree it's going to, to wipe all them out. But it is going to be powerful. So how big are those hailstones? Well, one of you in the comments, I was going back and watching the comments after the live to see if you had anything that you shared. And somebody said a biblical talent, because that's what it tells us. Those hailstones coming from heaven, not from the clouds, from heaven. That means the firmament, I believe, because you remember he called the firmament heaven. Um, it says every one of them weighing about a talent, these stones. And a stone or a talent that this would weigh is about 100 pounds Okay, so that's that's a lot of weight, 100 pounds of ice falling from the firmament. That's not you're not going to be safe inside your house. In my opinion, you drop something from even an airplane that weighs 100 pounds onto your house. See what happens. It's going to go through all three levels. If you have a three story house, even like a skyscraper, I think that thing would make it through some floors. That's powerful. And so 100 pounds, that changes it. That would leave marks on this earth that would still be here. This entire earth would look like a lot of divots. Um, let's see, Joy said 200 pounds. I don't know. That's This is based on internet research here. Me saying how much is a talent? And it says biblical scholars okay, equate it to being 100 pounds. It could be smaller, could be more um, rather than 75. I think 75 was one estimate, but they're saying biblical scholars tell us it's 100. So if it's 100, if it's a 75 pound uh stone, that's still massive. That's going to leave, in my opinion, craters that we've never seen before. Yeah, like uh, 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 Dennis and Debbie are saying here, like the craters 
like the craters on the moon. Yeah, the moon is maybe you already experienced that. Now that those um, those craters on the moon, I, I've, I've seen some really cool experiments of how people believe they got there, and it has to do with like lightning sprites and the um, that powerful those electric charges that if you put them electric charges from like a Vendigraph generator and let them hit a smooth powdery surface, it will leave replicas of what's on the moon. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, yeah, fire like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, there's fire like Sodom and Gomorrah that's going to happen after the millennial reign. And then before it, it is that ice, which I think that's so cool. Ice with the first punishment, fire with the second punishment. One right before, one right after. It's amazing. Um, scary, though, to be them, you know, enduring that punishment. But I thought that would give you a better visual because we've seen what two and a half pounds can do. Two and a half pounds is the world's largest ever hellstone. You could hold that in your hand or hands. And here's what I, I a visual representation of what I think hundred pound hell balls would look like. This was some uh, circular stone uh, or circular ice balls that washed up on the shore of one of the Great Lakes. I'm trying to remember which Great Lake that was. You guys might know. But they washed up. I guess the ice was being molded as it was being pushed and broken apart. It kind of like uh, turned into little circles here. And someday, you know, far, you know, who knows how long time goes on. Somebody could take these pictures and go, look, millennial rain already happened um, because we see these hellstones. These were massive. These were the ones that fell from above. But this is a picture. This is a current picture. This is recent. I don't think that that punishment's only going to happen on one of the Great Lakes. It's going to happen uh, most likely worldwide. Um, in my opinion. So really cool stuff. But I've got, I want to get into the verses that seem to indicate the return would happen in that generation because I get told that a lot, that I'm calling Jesus a liar and you know that he said it was going to happen to that specific generation right then. It's going to happen soon. 2,000 years is not very soon. And if I'm saying that that's soon, then I'm a liar, that I'm calling him a liar. And it's it, it's that's where it starts getting really, really hateful. And uh, I understand. I understand where you're coming from. I'm looking at these verses. I'm going to continue looking at these verses and looking at prophecy. And so this verse here um, <clears throat> in Matthew is one of them where he's talking about some of them standing there, which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And in my opinion, like I said before, he was talking to all of them. Judas was there as well. He hadn't died yet. And they were going to watch him enter into his father's kingdom, taking up, taking up with the clouds, not returning with the kingdom and setting up the kingdom on earth, but entering into it, coming in his kingdom and not with. And again, this is my opinion on that verse. And he could have said, you know, all of you except for Judas here will be seeing that. And so they did Acts uh, chapter one, verse nine. It says that they saw him. They literally witnessed him. They watched him with their eyes taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Man, that would have been sad, but also magnificent to watch at the same time. But um, there's things that, other verses that sound very, very similar, like this one here. Very, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And uh, that's Matthew 24, 34. The Amplified Version says it a little differently. They added their own little dialogue here, it looks like. It says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, this generation, the people living when these signs and events begin, will not pass away until these things happen. Okay, I thought, wow, that sounds interesting, but they're kind of adding to until I looked at the parable of the fig tree and actually have, a, you know, I have three fig trees on our property. And those things are different than the other fruit trees we have. They don't, they don't have leaves sprouting out and all that stuff right away in early spring like the other ones do. They, they make you think they're dead. You'll think, oh my goodness, they, they died over the winter. And so you're just, you're just kind of sad. You're mourning the loss of these things the first year that you have them. You're like, oh no, I killed them. I didn't do my job. And sure enough, it's like they come back and um, they start sprouting and it's later than the other trees. And so that's why when Yeshua was talking, he says, learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So that's how I know now summer is close. When those when those fig trees, branches, start to get tender and put forth leaves. And it says, so likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, 
when all those things that he was telling them would happen, stars falling from the sky, you know, powerful things, events happening, all those earthquakes and things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, talking about that generation with the fig tree where all those things are happening, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So that fig tree parable, that fig tree generation. And this is this is a verse that somebody shared during a live stream. I appreciate it. Thank you. Whoever shared that, they said, or they said, read Romans 16, 17 through 20. So they wanted me to read it live. Um, or maybe it was just 20, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so that language, shortly, and the comment made was, do you really think shortly is 2,000 years, question mark? <laughs> like, seriously? And and honestly, when you read these things, that's why I understand where they're coming from when they think this is something that's happened that's, that was within you know months or years. Because even when Paul and I think 2 Timothy is writing his letter, he was saying, you know, there was people already back then saying that the resurrection had already taken place back then. And and so now the resurrection is claimed to have taken place around that time. So pretty soon around after Paul writing his letters. And so that word bruise here is crush or break in pieces. And so with the return, we're not crushing or bruising Satan. He is actually bound, as we saw earlier. He's bound for a thousand years. What we're doing when we teach the truth about the gospel of the kingdom, it is bruising Satan under their feet. Okay, The things that they're doing, casting out demons, going against doctrines of demons, undoing all that stuff, it's a big deal. And then Matthew 10, here's one I got yesterday. Somebody sent me a large list. Thank you for doing that. A large list of... Uh, of things that indicate that it happens soon. And uh, you have, these are the words of the Messiah. I value these. And I, I know um, we should really read these and understand the context because right here, there's, there's two separate verses I've put up here. The first one is, is one that they used and it said, but when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel. So that's just Israel till the sun, <clears throat> excuse me, till the son of man be come. So just Israel, they're not even going to have this message all the way through Israel, and he's going to come. So they're like, see, there it is. Well, you read on, Matthew 24, way later, he's telling us, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So you have these seemingly contradicting verses but when you understand, this is Matthew chapter 10, the first one. It's early on. He gave them the power and authority to cast out demons. And he's telling them, go to these houses, do these things. They're going to unite again soon, because when you look in the next chapter, they're uniting. And the disciples are hungry. They're pulling corn off of the stalks, and they're eating it out of the field. They were starving, probably because a lot of people weren't inviting them in to have dinner. And saying, oh yeah, come on in. Let's talk about let's talk about your message, this gospel of the kingdom you're you're preaching. Sounds like to me they were hungry for a reason. And so I could only imagine why they were hungry after this journey, instead of being well fed and uh, welcomed into people's houses. It's not a popular message. And so they were hungry and they reunited. So he came to them again. And then that's when you have a lot of different miracles happen and a lot of different things, and they're with Yeshua, they're with him in the garden. They didn't stay awake like they were supposed to, but they were there. And you have um, him telling them later in 24 that that gospel of the kingdom is going to reach the entire world. And then the end will come. So if you're the adversary, what are you going to do? You know your time runs out when that gospel of the kingdom reaches the entire world. What are you going to do? You're going to change the gospel of the kingdom message. When people hear the word gospel or when I heard it my whole life, I had a different meaning and understanding of what that meant compared to what I do now. A lot of people don't know what the gospel of the kingdom is. And it's very similar to how he told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His kingdom is coming. That was the gospel of the kingdom. And so that kingdom coming shortly, you know, it's going to happen. When he returns, it's going to be fast. 
when he says, I come like a thief, you know, I come quickly. That's how he's going to return. When he returns, you're not going to see him up in the sky and then go, well, I've got about 20 years to start getting ready and living right. Now that I see him on his slow journey here, no, it's going to be fast. You need to be ready because when he comes, he comes quickly. He arrives quickly. It's not going to be a slow process. You know, they start pointing cameras at the sky and saying, hey, we're seeing these signs and wonders and it's, it's taken months. I don't think that's going to be him. Okay, I think it could be their little alien threat, their fake one. Uh, it's going to be fast. And this is why Peter, I believe, when I started doing my studies into where we're at in time, because I wanted to know where we are in time, there's so much confusion. He says this, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. The world does not want you understanding what's in the Old Testament, reading what the prophets were saying, because it paints a picture, a picture that tells us where we're at. The Father would not leave us without a clue, without a roadmap to where we're going, where we are, and what his will is for us. And so Peter is saying, be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? It's going to, people are going to, people are saying that now. I've seen comments, people posting things, memes about this. Oh yeah, it's, you know, inappropriate things about the Messiah. They're bashing him. They're against him. Oh, he's, people have been waiting. It's been 2000 years now. They're still waiting. That's what they're going to say. Where's his promise? We thought it was going to be quickly. We thought it was going to be right away. Where is it? And then later on in that same chapter, he says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Don't be ignorant of that. So that is very soon. Two days isn't very long. It's not a long time. Two days. And it brings us back to the garden when the father told Adam he would die that day. When he ate of the, if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. The father, just like the Messiah, was not lying. When he said, you're going to die that day and he didn't die, I was so confused. I thought, man, the serpent was kind of right. I didn't want to talk about it because I thought, you know, that people think my faith isn't there. But I thought, why was the serpent not wrong? Why did he not die that day? And then people go, well, it was spiritual. And I took that and believed that for a long time. But no, he didn't just die a spiritual death. He literally died that day, that thousand year period, like Peter was talking about. He had an understanding of that. It was shown to him. And a lot of them knew that. And so, Adam, how long did he live? We'll look into that. I think I've got it somewhere in here. Let me see. Coming up. No, it's later on. Um, but that thousand years as a day, he didn't live to be a thousand years. It says in Jubilees, he died that day because the a day in the testimony of the heavens is as a thousand years. It tells us that in Jubilees. That's later on in the slides. I'll go over that. And so if you don't understand that concept, it's kind of new to you. Uh, we've done a video called The Generations of the Heavens and the Earth. It's I'll put it in the description. I'll go back and add it. I don't know if it's there. It talks about that. When you look at our prophetic timeline, it even, and it only makes sense when you look at it, like Peter said, with a thousand years being as a day and a day as a thousand years. Just like the Psalms tell us, uh, David here in the book of Psalm tells us, Psalm 90, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a night, and as a watch in the night. And Hosea, the prophet, his prophecy only makes sense. And it's like Peter said, be mindful of the prophets. It only makes sense when you understand that. Because he says, after two days, he will heal us. In the third day we shall arise. Was the beloved son's resurrection not pointing to something very similar? When it says in the third day we shall arise and live before him and shall know him. Let us follow on to know the Lord. We shall find him ready as the morning and he will come to us as the early and latter rain to the earth. So you have that morning of the third day. The beginning of the third day didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Until I started looking into where we are in time, 
you realize after Yeshua left, our calendars changed. When I was, you know, a young teenager, we had the new millennium, this new millennial day. Well, if a thousand years of being as a day and you start your count from after the resurrection, we're getting very close to that third day or the end of that second thousand year period. Getting very, very close. Some people say, oh, it's 2030 or it's 20 this, 20 that. I'm not going to put a date out there. It could be next year. I want you guys to be ready. It could be any day. Be ready. I don't want to give you false hopes into thinking you have extra time. I don't know the day or the hour, but it's going to be close according to what I'm seeing, I believe. And so um, Luke, I was just here's a verse here in Luke that I, I thought went well with that. It says, behold, I cast out devils and I do cures. This is the Messiah talking today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Think about Jonah. He talks about Jonah as well, that third day being brought back to life. The Father left us a roadmap, something to show us where we are in time. Here's another one. Dear children, this is a verse that um, supports that it's the last days back then. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So they say, okay, that's the last hour. That was it. You know, I don't think this book would have got published if that was the last hour, because um, it took a while for this book to get published and the word to be put together, to be assembled so that people can have it and share it and, and you know, deliver it, make this gospel of the kingdom, make it to every nation in the world. And so that word hour doesn't literally mean hour. It is a time period, a finite season, a limited opportunity to reach a goal. We have a very limited time to reach that goal, that gospel of the kingdom, making it to every nation. So uh, really cool stuff there. Let me see if I can full screen this so I can read it. Um, if they were saying it was the last hour, that goes against the words of the Messiah. If that really, if that word really meant the hour, because it says no man knows the day or the hour or of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And so watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. That's what we're talking about. Be ready. Comes like a thief. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Then in John, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. So it would have happened that hour um, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. So if we're taking that the way it sounds, those dead resurrected within that hour. But it's talking about that age, that time period. And then. Uh, Revelation, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. For in one hour, this is about, all the way up to 18, is thy judgment come. <clears throat> and so again, if this was a literal hour, the judgment would have came right after they wrote these words. And for in one hour, so great riches is come to nothing. Just a lot of verses that have to do with the hour. And then we've got good old Flavius Josephus. People wanted me to talk about him and look into his writings, so I did. And again, this is going to be rapid. I'm not going to go as, spend as much time as I once did talking about these things because Josephus was a writer. And I'm trying to remember the time period this was. Um, but yeah, it was around that time period that they say that the resurrection happened around 70 AD. And he says, so it was when a star resembling a sword stood over the city and, and a comet, which continued for a year. That's only possible on a biblical earth model. And it says, besides these, a few days after the, that feast on the one and 20th day of the month, Armit, Artem, Artemisius, it's named after Artemis, I believe, which is a false god. And they're saying here that that was probably May or June. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would 
seemed to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals for before sunsetting chariots. Oh, wow. And troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. And so when people hear that, they think that was the great day of God Almighty. Um, but remember, people are going to be attacking. They're going to be gathered together, Armageddon. And it says, sound of a great uh, multitude, moreover, at the feast, which we call Pentecost. Huh, signs in the heavens. As the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministration, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. They didn't hear a trumpet. They didn't see the beloved son. Remember, every eye shall see. Flavius over here is giving an account and a witness account where people saw this. He's talking about it. He didn't say, oh, I saw it and it was great. He's saying they would have thought it was a fable had not so many people seen it. And this reminds me of Acts chapter two. Remember, this is around that time. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. You have all these signs. And here's the things that Flavius and the others that wrote after him. There were other writers that wrote after him, plenty of them that kept writing and telling the story. They weren't talking about the millennial kingdom. They didn't see the return of Yeshua. They didn't see the resurrection of the dead, Mark of the Beast, Battle of Armageddon, great hell falling out of heaven and plaguing men, lying signs and wonders, son of perdition claiming to be God, the tribulation, stars falling, sun going dark, great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea and a third part of the water becoming blood. Star called Wormwood falling and third part of the water becoming Wormwood and the third part becoming, oops, typo, sorry. A hundred pound hailstones, like I said earlier, falling down. Um, Euphrates drying up. Sorry, guys, my notes. I, when I compile these things, I get excited and sometimes I hit paste too many times. Uh, the Millennial Kingdom, they didn't talk about that and they didn't talk about world peace. Those would be a big deal. Didn't talk about that. And so, again, quick summary, rapid fire here. Now we have the mud flood evidence. I've been skimming through videos and really trying to get into the minds of people who are really captivated by this. I understand the ancient technology and the captivation there. There, there were some smart people. We're, we're fed the evolution myth that our ancestors were really dumb, but instead it's been sort of the opposite. We're getting dumbed down. We're getting placed into um, environments where we're, for one, we're given a lot of fluoride, uh, two, we're poisoned, and three, we are being educated in a way that really isn't helping our children prosper the way they should. Now, I love educators. I am an educator and people are working the best they can. But the way that people had knowledge and shared knowledge, it was just its crazy. Things passed on. But you also have to realize there was a lot of people seeking after and still are that wisdom of the fallen to do things that they did pre-flood. They were corrupting all flesh. What are they doing now? They're corrupting all flesh. And so you see things and, and it fascinates you like these buildings here. I was watching a video and these videos, they don't get the little Wikipedia things underneath them like like our biblical earth videos or any other videos we talk about. They don't get that. They're promoted. And you see a lot of the same little things being shown. And this is one of them. There's the mud floods. And so look at this building on the left. That's, this is what they talk about. And then look at the one on the right. You can tell the one on the left is most likely older. There's no power lines. The one on the right, there is power lines. And look at the ground level. The ground level is pretty close to the door, wouldn't you say? And they only need about, you know, seven or eight stairs. Can't really see them, how, how many there are. But the one to the left, there's like a large area. There's no stairs. You know, this building, it's like they had to dig up the ground. But remember, this picture on the left is most likely older, in my opinion, because there's no power lines. But one thing you see when you start zooming in on the pictures, you, you know, I took screenshots from their videos and I zoom in, you see that they're doing foundation repair. They're digging up the ground on this building. It's supported with these little joists that are holding it up probably doing some leveling there. You got to really, if you're, if you're digging up a foundation to do something, 
to do some repairs, whatever they're doing, who knows, maybe they're adding plumbing into this thing. You can see on the building itself where the dirt once was, and it lines up with where it is now. This building, I believe, is still there. So you can see, kind of overlay them here, a little back and forth action so you can see. The ground has been dug down where that man is standing to the right of the building on top of that little platform. Looks safe. This was before OSHA, by the way. Um, they weren't building on top of, you know, old technology. This is just the foundation of a building. But people see that and they go, man, it was a mud flood. You know, it really wiped everything out. And this is from a thumbnail of the video. Mud floods and worldwide cover ups. So to cover it up, there was a worldwide mud flood. And when I would hear these words a long time ago, people would always go, you got to look into the mud floods. It's it's fascinating. I'm just lured into it. I can't stop watching the mud flood stuff. And I just wasn't pulled into that topic at that time. Again, that was before I knew about prophecies and things and studied that really hard. And I still have a lot of learning to do. But um, I'm glad I really didn't get too caught up in it because it just didn't it just didn't intrigue me. But it seems to be intriguing a lot of people. And there is a cover up. There, there is ancient technology. There are things like that. I'm not saying that our historians are just completely honest people and that everything's the way we say they say it is. Um, but there is a covenant that our father made that he established in Genesis where it says, I will establish my or he says, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And so this worldwide mud flood is mud is literally water moving the dirt. And there was a lot of that when you had the original flood. And so when there's floods, these are not worldwide floods, local floods, they do move. That water moves a lot of soil and covers things up. Does this all the time in many different locations. Seeing that a lot now, places like California getting those floods. But you also have, you got to consider this. There's people living under us sometimes. Don't want to mention any names. Don't want to get flagged here. <laughs> but, you know, there's people living under us. And when I was looking, doing my research into those ancient maps from the 1500s, way back when they had accurate maps of the world, which shows me they probably had technology to fly, you know, airships like they talk about. They knew probably how to make hydrogen or um, harvest helium. They knew these things, I'm pretty sure, um, based on how they really weren't that excited when the airplane was invented. There's videos of that. And, you know, the Wright brothers allegedly inventing our first flight. Um, they weren't watching it. They weren't looking up in awe. They were like, you know, here, here's somebody flying in something that's not nearly as cool as these giant airships we've already had and seen. And so there's uh, that map, that ancient map, um, the Urbano map, I'm trying to think of the exact name of it. But we've done videos about it. And the, the, writing when you translate it as best you can from its Italian, old ancient Italian to English, it talks about people living under the ground in every nation. And so structures being underground, being buried up, um, doesn't really surprise me too much. Um, but a lot of these structures, the claim is that these are millennial kingdom structures, that the people during the millennial kingdom were just really good, you know, masons, not Freemasons, just masons, you know, really good building with stone and, um, that's why they have all these nice Gothic structures literally just carved out of the sides of cliffs here. And I don't deny that these things are amazing. They are really, you know, phenomenal structures. Did they have wireless electricity? Who knows? Um, but if there's no air conditioning, you're going to want to build most of your house underground. The only way to really have a cool environment in the summer, or especially where I live in the summer, is to go down under the ground and have part of your dwelling under the ground. And so... The way they did these things, were they carving it directly out of rock? I don't know. Did they carve it out of clay and then just like superheat it and make these nice structures that look like they were just carved out of stone? I don't know. Is this a pre-flood structure? Possibly, you know, because if it's if it's evidence of a flood and that's why it's surrounded by mud that's the exact same color of the building, um, I don't think that would just wouldn't make sense to me because the, the building would be a different stone than the mud around it. So this does look like it's literally carved out of whatever that stone structure is sitting there. Um, but we're always digging up these types of structures, underground structures. 
because there was a flood. There was a mud flood, but it was not just a mud flood. <laughs> it was a flood, a worldwide flood with the floodgates or the fountains of the deep opened up. And then you have the windows of heaven. And when you dig into that, that word window, it's like a sluice, like this thing that would just let water out. There was seven of them all around the world. Every continent had a floodgate. And so all of these buildings and structures made by these Nephilim and these people that are corrupting the earth, these unclean spirits that would soon come from them, all these things going on pre-flood, we can we can find them. You dig, you find pre-flood stuff. Sometimes you dig, sometimes you can go swimming and you can find these pre-flood civilizations and the proof that they were there. It wasn't that long ago. You know, Yeshua was here a couple thousand years ago. We still see some, those structures that were there at that time. It was about that long before him, 2,000, you know, 300 something years before him when we had that flood. Not a long time ago. So those flood, those structures buried beneath the mud, a lot of them still there, still poking through. And uh, a lot of people think it's melted stone. I don't think it's melted stone. I think there's a lot of erosion. And when rocks and things erode, what happens? Um, they make more rock. Okay. It's going to like kind of like stalactites and stalagmites. You see that uh, there's places in the world where you can, you can hang a teddy bear from a string and three months later it turns into stone. And if you look above, you know, you'd say, oh, that's melted, melted stone there above it. But no, that's just that same type of stone that's forming from that water and those minerals washing through. And a large flood would petrify a lot of things. We've got petrified trees. We've got um, places on earth where there's actual melted stone and you can see it and it's melted soil. This is where the Red Sea crossing happened. That pillar of fire passed through, melted it. So again, flood happened. It wasn't that long ago. Um, I think it was 2344 BC, back when I was doing my calendar research. Again, could be wrong. And so the elite, you know, a lot of people say they hid Tartaria with this mud flood, you know, like when the enemy was let loose in the 1700s. They, I just don't think they have the ability to flood the entire world with mud. Um, you know, like the the do energy things that people are talking about now. Yeah, they've got that technology, but just flooding and building directly on top of it. I mean, tell me if I'm if I'm missing if I'm missing anything to me, this just doesn't make sense that they would flood millennial structures when the millennial kingdom is still here. So I wonder, I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something there, but I, I just, it, it, it starts getting me really confused when I'm trying to see what people believe on it. And there's no real clear answer um, with timelines really, or a lot of these things. And so it's, it's hard for me to figure that out. And um, what tar how Tartaria plays into it. We'll get into Tartaria here in a little bit. But it says, I, I was writing my notes here, putting my thoughts out that there are no prophecies that state that the millennial kingdom will be wiped out or hidden. People will know it's there and will be convinced to attack it as Yahuwah will be the only king of the earth in those days and his saints will be reigning with his son. So that's my opinions on that. And you have... Also here, this is some structures, and I saw a comment, and it's, it's things lead me down these different uh, trails, but somebody looked at this building from the 1800s. It's a Masonic temple in Philadelphia, but somebody was sharing a picture of it, and they go, yeah, you really think they made that with a horse and buggy? You know, this is more like a Tartaria type of structure. Uh, however, I look into it, and it's like, man, I really don't think these are Millennial Kingdom type structures or Tartaria and how that ties into the Millennial Kingdom. It's kind of a mystery. I don't know what the whole train of thought is there. But these structures, we don't build structures like this today. We don't put as much care and time and thought and effort. Yes, they probably had horse and buggies back then. They may have had other stuff, um, but they definitely had horse and buggy. There may have been a great reset, and that's what everybody had after it. Uh, but you got to realize these unclean spirits like frogs, deceiving the kings of the earth, they are going to practice what they're going to do. So they might let a kingdom get really big and really advanced and then practice uniting them. But, oh, no, they're too strong. OK, let's take them out. You know, there's there's always that trial and error. They've had they've got a limited time to practice these things. So practicing it with Tartarian Empire makes sense. But here here's the inside of that uh, temple. I started looking at this because I, I pulled that temple up to go, man, you know, these people are saying that. Yeah, right. You know, this isn't something built in the 1800s. But I look at it and this Masonic temple in Philadelphia, of all places, has an Egyptian room. 
And I see this familiar little Egyptian deity that I'd seen before. Um, you see some symbols on the ceiling that you've seen before. Uh, right there, I got it outlined in red. But this room, it's like they try to mimic the Temple of the Most High. They almost have like their own Ark of the Covenant with two serpents on there. Um, but those goddesses you see in the background, it's an Egyptian goddess, Hathor. And so you see it. It looks a lot like uh, little Master Yoda, a little female version of Master Yoda. But she was the goddess of many things, beauty, music, dancing, fertility, like Easter, uh, pleasure. She was the protector of women, you know, all that. And though men also worshipped her, she had priests, because these demons want to be like the Most High, priests and priestesses in her temples. And there I saw that. And the first time I ever saw one of these carvings, it was from a, a new archaeological dig where they found what I thought looked like a, a replica of Master Yoda, but it was that same goddess, and it's her little cap on her head. You can't really see it. And so it just looks like a Master Yoda figure. And so I started doing some digging into that, and I've talked about that before, him being based on this type of creature. I could be wrong on that. I just thought it was fascinating. Um, but a lot of these demonic influences that we see and these structures that are way better than a lot of the things we build now that were built back in the 1700s, 1800s, they are using the wisdom of the fallen to do these things, to get their measurements, to set up their pyramid-like temples, even the same structures. And guys, this is the house of the temple in D.C., the devil's capital. I think, no, no, it's District of Columbia. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. <laughs> um, but you can see in our old pictures, back before they really did, you know, they were changing history at this time as well. Look at that. Here's Mr. George Washington. Here's him, you know, his belt matches the one on this house of the temple in D.C. And look in his compass that's hanging from his little medal of honor he's got. What's in the middle of it? It's a sun. They're sun god worshipers. Hathor, the goddess you just saw in that temple, was a sun god. She's the eye of Ra. I think the right eye, if I'm remembering correctly. So just a lot of stuff that just... It's dark. There's that dude there with the, the ram horns on his head. Sun God in the middle right there. In this temple in D.C. Showing you their sun God. Let there be light on their little eye of the pyramid as if that's the most high speaking. But that's their God that they trust. And all these structures, I mean, just magnificent. I can see why you get excited about seeing these old structures. They're very similar. I think that's why the, they call themselves Freemasons. They've been around for a while. And they've been masons. They're building with stone. They're doing these things. And they are following the patterns given to them and the methods from that ancient of the fall. And of course, back then they built structures we can't understand pre-flood. Why? Because there were giants. You can see it in their paintings. They show you. You don't have to be able to read their writing. They draw pictures to show you how these things went down, who they served who they worship, feeding the Nephilim, all the things that you see, just like it says in Genesis. If you don't read the book of Enoch, you can read Genesis. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto, whenever you hear the words came in unto, that's usually talking about the act of um, doing the deed. <laughs> and so that was that's something you can read about in Enoch. It really gives a better picture of how the earth became so corrupt within that first thousand years. And why it is, this is another one here, proof. Uh, these are structures, a lot of them like, you know, the Washington Monument. These things are all around the world. And most times they are transported from, from Egypt to the places, especially Rome. Rome has this obsession. Um, even France transported from Egypt, moving these things. Back in those horse and buggy days, allegedly. Uh, a 4,000 year old obelisk transported to the Vatican. I mean, look at these things. I've highlighted in blue the ones that are transported from Egypt. But you have them in all these places, D.C. of all places. And when the one, the Washington Monument was, was made in D.C., uh, the article I saw said it was the biggest structure at that time, the biggest building at that time when it was made. Crazy. You don't think of that as being the biggest building because we've got all these massive skyscrapers now. Um, uh, Cleopatra's Needle in New York. Guess where it came from? Egypt, right there. New York City. These things are important to those that rule over us. They are so important that they will ship them, risk lives, 
protect these things, baby them. Could you imagine moving a stone that large and not breaking it back then? Uh, the one in Luxor Temple, uh, Luxor, <coughs> excuse me, Luxor Temple in Egypt. You've got Heliopolis, where they worship the sun god Ra. Uh, Rome again, Ethiopia to Rome. There's so many in Rome. Rome is just full of obelisks. I mean, if you go there, you're gonna. If you don't look where you're going, you're probably gonna walk into an obelisk. These things are everywhere, and this lawlessness, like we talked about with our mystery of iniquity, um, the same people that are building those structures and deceiving people today. They're all about lawlessness, that Egyptian and Babylonian practice, that wisdom of the fallen that's returned after the flood. That's why their oaths look the same. We've talked about that and who they are and why they lie. Exactly the same. Have to make oaths being like their um, fathers did. The fallen made an oath to corrupt the world. And so you see the people that are making those oaths, just like the fallen did, carrying out a mission to deceive. And based on the millennial, the little season timeline, the Jesuit order would have been established during the millennial kingdom. The heliocentric treaties, when it was dedicated to Pope Paul III, by someone associated with the Jesuits, I believe, um, Mr. Copernicus, that would have been during the, the millennial reign, when the Freemasons were established, the 1590s. That would have been during that time period as well. Skull and Bones, 1800s, same thing. United Nations, under a Masonic president, same thing. CIA under a Masonic president, same thing. NASA during the Millennial Kingdom. So, I mean, it's those things would have had to have happened during the Millennial Kingdom. And so Tartaria, how that plays into this, again, that Millennial Kingdom. I'm still confused. Help me out. How? how what am I missing? Because you look into Tartaria, obviously they've silenced it. They've changed the name. And the Jesuits, I'll find an article. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is. Um, it says the use of Tartary, because it used to not be Tartaria, I think it was Tartary, declined as region as the region became more known to European geographers. However, the term was still used long into the 19th century or the 1800s. So people were still calling it that in the 1800s. And then it says ethnographical data collected by Kesu, Jesuit missionaries in China contributed to the replacement of Chinese Tartary with the with Manchuria in European geography by the early 18th century. The voyages of Igor Mayendorf and Alexander von Humboldt into this region gave rise to the term Central Asia. So they just they wanted to get rid of that name for whatever reason. And Tartarus isn't a name, not it's not like a biblical prophetic name for the Millennial Kingdom. Um, Tartaria I think they changed it from Tartar to Tartaria. There was some name change based on how powerful this empire was becoming. It was to be related to Tartarus, the underworld, Sheol or hell. And so it was a massive kingdom, Asia, and you can't have uh, people too united. You've got to divide and conquer if you're the enemy. And so division is key. And so it says by the 20th century, Tartary as a term for Siberia and Central Asia was obsolete. So they no longer called it Tartary. Sorry, guys, I skipped some things there. Um, but yeah, it, it's that Russian area, Asia, which if you look on a map, that's that um, Gog and Magog territory. So there it is again. You, you can find it in old maps. I went onto that old map site where I found the ancient map from the 1500s, and you can find places with Tartaria. But it also has Asia right there in, in print as well. So they kind of were interchangeable at a time, and then they finally slowly just started using Asia. So there is some mystery there and Jesuits involved. So that's that's a bit more intriguing. That was when I was finally like, wait a minute, what are these Jesuits doing here? Um, they don't want a giant kingdom with technology that they're sharing, free energy, all that stuff. They want to control the resources, limit us. You know, the Tartarian people, they might have been people that believed in the geocentric model and they had to war against them, take them out. Who knows? I don't know. There's a lot of things that are hidden. Okay, we'll, we'll know soon. Uh, but that brings us here to 2 Timothy, uh, where it talks about keeping away from godless babbling. It says, for those who engage in it will only become more ungodly, and their teachings will eat away at people like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among these. They have missed the mark as far as the truth is concerned by saying that our resurrection has already taken place. 
and they are overturning some people's faith. Nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands stamped with these words. The Lord knows his own and let everyone who claims he belongs to the Lord stand apart from wrongdoing. And so it was overturning faith back then, close to that 70 AD time period when they're writing these letters to people and going out and trying to get this gospel of the kingdom to every nation. People were saying, resurrection's already happened, guys. Quit trying to spread this message. It's already happened. And so that was during this writing here to Timothy. And so looking at where that was in time based on where I believe we are, you know, Yeshua coming right there where it says 0 AD. Uh, and the first time the Father ever came, or not the first time he ever came, but the first time he gathers people together at Mount Sinai. You see that trumpet, that very first trumpet there? That was on the third millennial day, correct? It happened around that time. And so that was when he came with the clouds of heaven. It was in the morning. It was on the third day. And you look at that. And then you have Yeshua coming around that 0 AD period. I put 0 AD right there because I don't really it, it, I don't really know where you want to start your calendar from. It could be the resurrection. Some people say it's when the temple was destroyed. I, I, I tend to believe it's more about the time of the resurrection, which is why I think we're very, very close. If Yeshua was 30 to 34, 33, who knows how old he was when he was actually crucified. A lot of people say 33. I don't see it actually mention that number. That's more of a number that the um, secret societies like to hijack. And so I don't like to say that's how old he was. But um, going into where we are now, 1000 AD, uh, not, not 1000 AD, um, 2000 AD, somewhere past that, somewhere in that area, this, uh, the sixth millennial day about to reach the seventh millennial day. And if I can, let me find my slides. Sorry, my slides are a little mixed up. Let's see if I can find them. There they are. Well, I need my, my good old study on here. It limits this to 100 slides. Okay, so it cuts off all my other slides. Interesting. We're only on slide number 93 right now. So yeah, it's taken out some of my slides, but um, looking at that thousand year reign and resurrection and prophecy, again, we talked about Hosea. There it is. There's one. Um, you notice when Yeshua came, looking back at that timeline, this is the same timeline, zero, zero being where it was earlier. You had that Hosea prophecy happening on the fourth millennial day during that fourth millennium from creation. So if you've never looked into this millennial day timeline, this will be kind of confusing to you. So I apologize. You really need to watch our Generations of the Heavens of the Earth video where we break it down simply. But the uh, life, death, and resurrection happened right there when the fourth and fifth day came together. And so according to that prophecy of Hosea, us rising on the third day makes sense because that first millennium from zero CE to a thousand, that's that first day. Remember the second day he's going to revive us which would be that sixth millennial day. And in the third day, he's going to raise us up. This prophecy was made before the calendars were changed to have the year of our Lord, before we had AD. Well, now we have CE, so they've changed it again. Always changing things, can't have it simple. But that AD, meaning Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. When Hosea made that prophecy, he didn't know that the calendars were going to change like that, and that we were going to have a new millennium and a new way of keeping time. And to where our new third day is mimicking when the Father came with the clouds of heaven on that third millennial day. Now it's the new third day. And, and this is a big one. Okay, understanding, like Peter said, the words of the prophets. And that a thousand days, or that a, yeah, a thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years. Kind of a tongue twister to say that many times over and over. But that's where I believe we are. And the claim that a thousand years was added would put us back in time, meaning Yeshua was only here a thousand years ago and that the millennial reign has been going on since 70 AD, which would mean that it's going to end around 70, uh, 1070, and we're at 1024. So that's where I also get confused because 70 AD to 1070 AD, if they've added a thousand years, 
seven, that little season hasn't even started yet. We're still in the millennial kingdom period, that thousand year reign period. And when I look to the maps and the times that they give, the timelines, I, I've never seen a real clear one that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but a lot of them, uh, they just have different different ways of looking at it or saying, you know, maybe it's really confusing. We'll figure it out eventually. I don't know. I haven't really seen a, a good one that, that's clear to me. But I believe our timeline mimics creation. And I'm not saying creation was 6,000 year period with a 1,000 year rest. It was literal days, but it was prophetic and showing us that day of rest to come. He blessed the Sabbath and it lines up with Enoch's 10 week prophecy. And it lines up with what Jubilees tells us. I was telling you, you know, earlier that Jubilees quotes exactly that. When it talks about Adam dying, it says, and he lacked 70 years. Of, a thou of 1,000 years, for 1,000 years are as one day in the testimony of the heavens. And therefore was it written concerning the tree of knowledge, on the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. For this reason, he did not complete the years of this day, for he died during it. So the father didn't lie when he said he was going to die that day. But why the serpent wants you to ignore that book entirely. And that brings us to the end. It's not letting me see the rest of my slides. Oh, no. <laughs> Why not? I'm going to remove this. I'm not sure what's going on. It like limits, I guess, StreamYard limits you to a hundred slides. You guys are like, thank goodness. We can't handle anymore. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me see if I can um, cut out after a hundred my slides, paste them into another one and um, go from there. I wish StreamYard would have warned me. They stop at a hundred trying to go fast. Lots of stuff to cover, and I want this to cover many of the hard-hitting things that I've seen. Find where my stopping place is. Oh, it's missing. Enoch's 10-week prophecy. Sorry, guys. I don't understand why it's limiting me to 100 slides. But either way, get to the bottom of this. Not seeing my last slide. Oh, here it is. Found it. So, Command C. Just hit Command C a lot. There we go. Start a new blank presentation. I'll just title this one Part Two. Years from now, when I'm digging through these things, I'll be like, what does Part Two mean? Oops. Sorry, guys. Thanks for your patience as I work to pull this up. Frustrating stuff. Let me come back and see if I can add this presentation. Share slides. Continue. Allow. Here we go. There's part two. Okay. Let's let that load in. Maybe my voice will break. My voice starts going out when I talk too much. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. I think it popped up. Part two. Ba -ba -bum. So there you go. There you have it right there. Um, Adam dying that day. Sorry for the brief intermission. So he died that millennial day, like Jubilees tells us. And when you line those millennial days up with creation, it paints a really cool prophetic picture in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Right when you finish reading the creation account, he blesses the seventh day. Then what happens? It tells us these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. It's like he was giving us a major clue right there in Genesis chapter 2. We ignored the truth of creation for years and years, you know, many generations. The Jesuits and all those that we've seen doing their little work during what would have been the millennial reign, if we're in the little season now, doing all those deceptions and deceivings while the enemy was supposed to be bound. Um, if that were the case, you know, that, that's that's still a time of deception. It's not going to happen during the millennial kingdom. That's why I feel like this is um, off the mark. 
like it says, as far as truth is concerned. But um, th those things were going on. Those things have been going on over the last thousand years. We've had lots of deceptions building, definitely within the last 500 years, getting us to, to skip over the second day of creation and all those things that are so powerful now and bringing people back to the truth. And so this is another one I feel like we missed, Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And Enoch, he sees a lot of things. He sees in his 10-week prophecy um, <clears throat> a lot of things. But it says here that, um, and this is in Enoch chapter 87. It's hard to see on my little screen. It says, and those three that had last come forth grasped me by the hand and took me up away from, like it says in Genesis, the generations of the earth and raised me up to a lofty place and showed me a tower raised high above the earth and all the hills were lower. And one said unto me, remain here till you see everything that befalls those elephants, camels and asses and the stars and the oxen and all of them. And so this was based on a vision that um, Enoch had had with the stars representing the fallen and those three different animals representing the three groups of giants or Nephilim, which would the Nephilim would eventually become unclean spirits, and they're the ones deceiving us now. So Enoch was able to see all of that to the very end, and the only way I think it was possible to see it was to go up above these generations of the heavens and the earth. So it's really, really cool. Jubilees tells us that he was the same uh, type of story that he was taken to the garden, which the garden was never destroyed, okay? But it says, for there, the Garden of Eden, he was set as a sign, talking about Enoch, and that he should testify against all the children of men, and that he should recount all the deeds of the generations, plural, until the day of condemnation. So you have his 10-week prophecy. And my wife, the beloved mathematician, she's a math teacher, understands numbers better than me. And so she'll go, oh, 10 weeks. That's, you know, each week when you look at it, that represents 700-year periods. And you add that up, you do the math, that's 7,000 years. So that seven is significant, just like the menorah candle. Okay, you've got three little branches on the left, three on the right, and one in the middle that's set apart. Pretty cool. Because now, when you look at our timeline in thousand year periods, we're in that second day, that second branch right there towards the end of it. And man, it's fascinating. If you've never read the book of Enoch, and looked at that 10-week prophecy, it shows us some things that line up with a lot of the things we're seeing. And like the people that did the Messiah 2030 video, they've seen a lot of things too that are very similar. And so with each, what did I miss? I think I missed something here. With um, each of those time periods being described, we've talked about this 10-week prophecy before. You can look at it. We're near, um, we're in the, what would be the ninth week right now where it says beginning of the ninth week, judgment of the righteousness will be revealed to the whole world and the world is marked for destruction. Because remember, we're going to have a new heaven and earth. And it says all men are on the watch for path of, for the path of integrity. This is summarized because I've tried to make it fit in one screen. Okay. So that time period, there's not going to be a deceiver. Everyone's going to be on that path of integrity. The world's going to be marked for destruction. Why? Because after that thousand year reign, it's going to be destroyed. We're going to get a new heaven and a new earth like the prophets have spoken about. So lots of really cool things here um, with the 10 week prophecy. And I've, I've gone through this again in a video where we go step by step by step. Sorry for going fast if you're really wanting to see this, but we're somewhere over here right next to that. 1, 000, final 1,000 year period, which I believe will be like the seventh millennial day or the seventh day of creation, a day of rest, thousand year period with peace, just like the prophets have told us. And so that 10th week, it says here the 10th week and after the, this in the 10th week in the seventh part, there will be the judgment to eternity, which is held over the watchers and the great heavens of eternity which will spring forth from the midst of the angels and the first heaven will pass away and cease and a new heaven will appear and all the powers of heaven will shine to eternity sevenfold. After that, there will be many weeks without number to eternity. 
in goodness and in justice, and sin will not be mentioned from that time on to eternity. So I don't know what happened to that slide. Something happened. So lots of cool things, and I don't know why it's repeating some of my slides here. But here's a um, little season version of that timeline. It's almost exactly the same, only, I mean, the, event, the events have to be. You have to have the thousand-year reign and Gog and Magog. Um, but the other side of the fence, the other side of the argument, there's the Battle of the Gog and Magog, Revelation 20. That's where a lot of people think we are. And what we just looked at is right before their first little dot. This is a timeline I took from somebody's video who believes we're in the little season. And so it, it does make a bit of a difference as to what you believe. And I've had people ask, um, what does it make? And we're going to be looking at that pretty soon. But that's their timeline. And again, if that's the case um, and it happened at 70 AD, we're still looking forward to that little season that'll be around 1070. Extremely um, different timeline than what I've been seeing lately. And uh, some of the evidence we looked at was that letter J that they turned into a one. Those Jesuits turned into a one or whoever. And sometimes it's an I. And now they've turned it into a one. And I, and I shared this with my wife because I was like, you know, there might be something to this. And she said, well, let's look and see in that exact same time period, these old tombstones and things, if they have a J and the J really it was not a one. And it was just talking about, you know, the year of our Lord, like um, standing for Jesus, you know, the new modernized version of his name after the J was invented, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1500s, then there's going to be some uh, pretty profound evidence supporting that because there's other times where you're going to have a J. And so like the year 1811, if it's J, it would be J8, JJ, <laughs> if that's how they were, if they were just replacing the ones. And so she said, let's look for some that have the number one in other places. Like this one here, 1722 is J722 on this old time stone. And August 16th, is August J6. So there's another one. It wasn't, that, that didn't stand for Jesus. Otherwise, they wouldn't have put it for the day as well. And our Constitution, all right, right there would have had, you know, or I guess the Declaration of Independence when they signed it would have been like that. But they have right here another one, 1791. And I couldn't figure out, I'm like, why would they make their ones look like J's? You know, even in the 14th, July 14th, it's J4TH, you know, 14TH, and then J79J, 1791. The person was 76 years old. Well, somebody sent me a website and it was telling me about the letter J uh, for the name Jesus being invented at a certain time period in the 1500s, and it was used in place of the Roman numeral one. So I think that is why that became a popular thing, using a J instead of a 1. Because, again, we've come from the Roman Empire. Obviously, when you look at D.C., it looks like a replica of Rome. Uh, we've taken up a lot of those practices. So that's why they would be using that letter J. So many times they wanted us to use that letter J. Uh, when they changed the Messiah's name, <clears throat> they had to let us you know, get familiar with that J, J sound because the J wasn't around back when Yeshua was here from what I have gathered in my research. So yeah, a lowercase j. Very weird. Why? <laughs> that's what somebody said. Um, lowercase j. Weird. Yeah, why would they do that? What is the j? Well, that's it. They replaced the Roman numeral 1 around the 1500s with the letter j sometimes. And so you would see that practice kind of like a font almost. Like when they're carving this stuff out, they carve it out like it's a font. And so engraving you see ones in many other places, not just in front of the year 1700 or 1800, because it's in front of both. You see it in the 1700s, but you also see it in the 1800s being used as a one. And it wasn't, from what I can see, to cover up, you know, to add another thousand years to the calendar. They were just using it in place of the number one, which was a standard practice. And so, precursors to the millennial reign and the return, there's a lot of them. I'm going to try to go through them real quick. Um, let me get rid of the little comment there. A lot of precursors according to the Messiah. So, I'm going to 
go over them. You guys can read Matthew chapter 24. That's where I'm getting these from. Yeshua's words himself. Let's skip to it. Got the bullet point version here. There shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. And I think I've mentioned a lot of these before. Iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. After the tribulation of those days is what's going to happen. The sun should be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. Stars shall fall from heaven. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And shall gather, this is key, together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I am looking forward to that. And then there's also Wormwood. You know, there it is, Revelation. That's where we're getting some of the stuff from. Stars falling from heaven. Again, this is a rapid fire version of the ones we've already done. And you see in the prophets, like Peter said, be mindful of the prophets. It's even mentioned in Joel, Zephaniah, Isaiah, these same exact things. Stars with, withdrawing, the sun and moon being darkened. You see those things right there in Joel chapter 3. Um, Egypt will be desolate. That's in Zephaniah. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. There's going to be survivors on that day of destruction. They're going to be outside the camp. It says people here, people from every nation required to go to the kingdom to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and worship Yahuwah so that they can receive rain. This is in Isaiah and Zechariah. That didn't happen over the last thousand years. Unless someone can show me, please show me. I'd like to see, <clears throat> excuse me, see where that happened. That'd be nice. Yahuwah shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Yah and his name one? And then he will gather us, or it says here, I will gather you from the four winds of heaven. And there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. That's yet to happen. Then will I turn the people to a pure language that they may call or all call upon the name of Yahuwah. That hasn't happened. That's going to undo the Tower of Babel. That's going to bring us back to that garden way of life. All other kingdoms will end. Everyone shall worship Yahuwah from their location. Like Peter said, be mindful of the words of the prophets. Yeshua prophesied many times as well. Worldwide resurrection and gathering of the elects, of the elect. The elect will meet Yahuwah and Yeshua in the air. Two witnesses killed. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. The beast, this is precursors here, whose name are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The Euphrates will dry up. Again, we saw that is happening as we speak. Merchants of the earth deceive the world with pharmakia. Uh, some of you guys, and it's hard to even talk about this and not <laughs> not even think about getting flagged. I just had a video removed yesterday, that I, and I thought I'd deleted all of our videos where we talked about stuff. And sure enough, in one of my videos, we mentioned the V word, and it got X'd, which I'm glad, I'm glad that we got rid of our other videos because I, I really thought they were planning this... Uh, this attack, they were letting some of our videos stay that I knew they shouldn't. And I thought, man, they'll probably just get them all at once. And then that's, that's what you get three strikes right away. So I got rid of them. They're on our um, backup platform on Odyssey. So lots of stuff in prophecy. Um, nations literally not going to war anymore, turning their swords into plowshares. Like it says in Isaiah, all the nations flowing unto it. Talking about, his house that's established on the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills, the Most High being the King of the earth. Gosh, I cannot wait. This is going to be awesome, guys. Um, there's no writings of that. Uh, that that's happened. That people are going there for a thousand years. In the word of the Lord, actually, I say for a thousand years, it's not going to stop happening. People are always, he's going to be king from then on. They're going to try to attack this king. It's not going to work. And he will remain king. You know, once all of the enemies have been defeated, like it tells us, that's when Yeshua is going to hand everything back to the Father. Once the, all those enemies have been 
basically destroyed under his feet. So significant times ahead, no matter which side you're on. So a lot of these things. Um, it says, let me see if I can make this bigger and see what it says. And they shall not hurt, nor shall they at all be able to destroy anyone on my holy mountain. For the whole is filled with the knowledge of Yahuwah as much as much water covers the seas. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall arise to rule over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. And his rest, talking about that rest, that thousand year period, on the seventh millennial day, shall be glorious. And it shall be in that day the Lord shall again show his hand to be zealous for the remnant that is left of the people which shall be left by the Assyrians and from Egypt. Because remember, when you look at the, the history of the Father's people, they came from all over. Abraham, his first child was born with an Egyptian wife. Like, and you know, when the people left Egypt, they didn't, they took, there was Egyptians that came with them. And so, and it says here, and from the country of Babylon, where, where are we being called out of in the end in Revelation? Come out of Babylon, come out of her, my people. Abraham came out of Babylon. He obeyed the Father. He did all the things that the Father asked him. He was doing them. And that's what it says. His faith was accounted as righteousness for him listening to the point that he would have even been willing to give up his beloved son for the Most High. We were reading about that today in Jubilees. And man, read about it in Jubilees. It paints a picture that just ah, it rips at your heart. Um, talking about his son, Isaac. He put the wood on his back as they're going up this mountain, the mountain of God, you know, Mount, what they call Mount Zion. They call it actually Mount Zion. And thinking about Yeshua, you know, saying, take up your cross and walk. And here's this Isaac foreshadowing, putting the wood on his back. He had a torch in his hand, it said. He's going up this mountain. And then they lay him down on that stack of wood. They put that stack of wood down and just, wow, man, it's it was a testing, you know, it's putting him through all these different tests throughout his entire life. And then blessing him to become, you know, that seed of Jacob, that all all nations being blessed. Yeshua coming from that same child. It's powerful. So anyways, sorry, side sidestep there. But just powerful stuff looking into this prophetic journey that's showing us where we are in time. Um, so many things. Even what David talks about here. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever and all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is governor among the nations. So a lot of stuff has happened in, over the last thousand years. If you haven't uh, researched into the past, it's a part of, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people think that the enemy was defeated in 70 AD, but that the enemy wasn't really defeated. There were a lot of things that happened um, with Rome, but the bad guys didn't really fully lose you know, the, the prophecies were being fulfilled. It has to be fulfilled. The word's going to reach every nation. Uh, but Christianity being persecuted for a couple hundred, you know, several hundred years or thousand years, really. I mean, like the Inquisitions, they were going after people like me, heretics, people that denied that the beloved son was who he said he was, or that people who actually believe that the beloved son is who he says he is. They want you to deny that and accept their creeds that were created a few hundred years after Yeshua left. They're changing his image. You have to adhere to those Roman creeds to this day. And to talk about that is controversial. Uh, I don't care <laughs> anymore. Time's running out. We got to talk about these things. We got to pray about these things. Ask the Father to show you, to be humble in this in this topic. I mean, this is important stuff. These are things that have been going on, um, which would have been going on during the millennial reign, the inquisitions, the creeds, all of that, if we're in the little season. Feeding them to the lions, all the wars that happened after. We've gone through this before. There's so many different wars in every century. Um, there's locations. A lot of people say it's at the North Pole. I understand why they believe that. And the verses are in Jubilees, it's, it's very, it sounds like it's literally talking about the North Pole. But you have places like Zechariah that tell us where it's at. Ezekiel tells us where it's at. Um, 
You guys can read these. You can screenshot these. Um, talks about the Mount of Olives being significant where his feet touch down. Um, locations according to prophecy. Uh, there's just so many of them. Mount Zion. And again, we were just reading about that in Jubilees today. Mount Zion. And he didn't walk very far. He didn't walk to the North Pole. It only took him a few days to get there. You can see these places on maps that are written about in prophecy. Lands being flattened out. You know, the Mount of Olives being basically broken apart. And it talks about it being in Jubilees, the center of the navel of the earth. And a lot of people think that's the center of the navel of the world. But the center of the navel of the earth is the center of that dry land. Where they were when these prophecies were spoken was the largest mass of dry land um, out there. I don't know about Antarctica, but the largest mass of dry land that was inhabited at that time, the known world, and right in the center of it. If I could, I guess I don't have that slide on here. Right in the center of it, smack dab in the center. We're pretty close to it is uh, where all these prophecies are taking place. It's like a big square. It almost has corners, the corners of the earth. Pretty cool. And so what difference does it make? Well, if you believe we're pre-resurrection, you're going to pray like Yeshua told us, thy kingdom come. You're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You're going to be mindful of the prophets like Peter said and understand that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. You're going to be preparing and wait, awaiting that resurrection, that last trumpet. If you think we're in the little season, it's going to be a little different. The kingdom has already come. You're going to be studying Tartaria. You're going to be studying a second flood that came, the mud floods, and preparing. You know, essentially all you have to do is avoid that battle of Gog and Magog. And so it's, it is two different things. It, it's, it's two different um, ways of life, ways to live. Um, it's, it's different. So it does, in my opinion, make a difference what you believe because Yeshua told us how to live and the gospel to preach, the gospel of the kingdom that is going to come. So it's, it's a big deal, and I'm starting to see that it's a really big divide. I don't want this to be something where you guys just run away and say we're not going to fellowship with you anymore because you're just denying everything. Uh, I really, really do hope you pray about this and keep us in your prayers. If I'm wrong, I want to be corrected and I'll come out and say, I'm sorry I was wrong. I've seen the light. Um, I, and I do. I still I have to humble myself and pray for truth on this because this is an important topic. And when I look at the prophecies and, and where it, the prophetic timeline is pointing us and all the precursors, I'm just not seeing that we're in the little season and it's trending now. And it'd be nice to be one of the cool kids and and doing little hangouts about, yeah, here, look at Tartaria and the mud floods and how we're there. And I just can't see it. I really cannot. And, and I've tried, I've really, I've, I'm really digging deep into this and um, people are saying you need to dig, dig, dig deeper, dig deeper. And, and I've seen a couple of videos, but it's, again, it's things where they're showing these buildings where they're digging up the foundation and seeing stuff. And it's, it's not based hundred percent on prophecy. And so it's, it's really tough for me to keep looking when I'm not seeing the prophecies. And that's all, I, that's really what I want. And if you have some, don't be hateful, send them to me, send me the prophecies, send them in an email. Um, if you want to set up a video call and you can just show it to me and break it down because, Hey, I'm just missing the mark. I'm not seeing what you're saying. Um, let me know. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to talk. Um, I have somebody who's wanting to share stuff with me and a lot of it I've gone through the prophecies, the ones like in Jubilees about the location being the North pole. If that's the case, it's still there. And by golly, I'm going to go there. Because that's where the, the kingdom's going to be here. If it's still here, we all need to head that direction. North Pole, go there right now. That's where it is. You need to go. And you need to try to jump that fence. Because he's right there. You could literally see his kingdom if, if that's where it is. Let's go. Come on. Um, so it would still be here. And and that would be a big deal. I would I would just drop everything I have, sell everything I have. I'd be going to the North Pole. Um, but I think the it is where prophecy says it is when he sets his feet down. The Mount of Olives. There's gonna, it's, it's a big deal. The Messiah returning, every eye will see. It, it's a powerful event. It's not just a powerful event. It's it's the, the great day that's talked about throughout prophecy um, with the, the Father coming to. It's, the Yeshua is not coming alone. He said he's returning at the right hand of power. You look at an older translations, it says the right hand of the Father, essentially, the right hand of God. And so the Father's going to return too. Um, he's going to be at the right hand of power. All right. And it's the trumpet of God, that last trumpet. It says it's the trumpet of God. 
And I think he's going to be blowing his own trumpet, that breath of life blowing through it. I mean, just just powerful stuff, you know, powerful, powerful stuff. And I, I thank you guys for sharing all that you've shared and being patient with us as we learn stuff and look into this stuff and and try to grow. I don't know everything. None of us do. Um, and that's the fun thing about it is having humble truth seekers out there that will share these things with us and talk with us and and be patient as we make mistakes, as you know, presentations run out on here and I have to switch over. Uh, my slides are all out of order. I can't remember where things are. Uh, I'm doing the stuff on the side. This is not my full time job. I'm not a full time. Um, uh, I guess I do study the word almost full time as much as I can, but we do have a full time job um, still in the education world. And so um, somebody said video call, Josh. Yeah, if you want to do a video call and just I don't want to hear a 12 hour lecture. I just want to see I want to see the timeline you have, how it lines up with prophecy how all of those precursors we've mentioned have happened, how those hellstones have fallen to this earth, how every eye has seen the Messiah, how the kingdom is still here. And I want to see that. I want it to be clear. I want it to be concise. And so, I, you know, I'm asking you to do some work. That's a lot to ask, um, but put it up on, on presentations. I'm a visual person. If you can just break it down, um, I would I'd appreciate that. There's a lot of big uh, trendy channels out there saying we're in the little season and I'm watching them and I'm trying to figure it out. And, and it broke my heart because I was watching one that I used to really love watching. And, and they're talking about Tartaria being here. And they said, and we're just waiting. Tartaria is going to come back. You know, like essentially they're awaiting the return of Tartaria of a earthly kingdom. And it just it's weird. It doesn't feel like we're awaiting the return of the beloved son. It's it, it's just a different it's a different message altogether. And it's a, so it just it's just been on my heart heavy. That's why I wanted to talk about it again summarize everything, look at everything again, and hopefully catch something I'm missing or have you guys share something that I'm not seeing. Um, I'm not giving it enough research. Please what uh, point me to some verses. What can I, what am I missing about these qualifiers, these prerequisites to the millennial reign? Um, like what are we missing? Um, I, re I really, I want it simplified. Send us an email. Our email is flatearthbrothers at gmail.com. It's in the description. Um, you know, send us what you have. I'm willing to look into it. I've been looking at verses. Some of the verses in this uh, presentation were things that I added this day from your comments. So, someone said you can't go to the, what do you mean to the NP? What is the NP? Can't go to the NP. Yeah. But yeah, mud flood was Armageddon with Alan Hughes, a consistent theology. I'll try to see. Yeah, I'll try to see what you're saying, the mud flood. Um, yeah, I've, I've been looking into that and I'm, I'm just seeing mud and flood and like the whole earth being flooded again. It just it seems like the father's breaking his covenant. Um that's a hard one for me to grasp. I do believe there were there are things hidden. There's things buried. There's there's a flood that came. Lots of, um, I mean, just intelligently designed structures from intelligently uh, created beings. The fallen were extremely intelligent. They were with the Most High. They left their first abode, like it tells us in the New Testament, and they sinned. They made a mistake, and so yeah, they have. Um, they, they, they definitely had a, a larger understanding than we would, being that they seen the pattern of everything in heaven, you know, because what was made with the, the temple and everything was based on a pattern in heaven. They knew mysteries. They knew secrets, but they didn't know everything. They didn't know what would happen after the beloved son was killed. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. That's what it tells us. And so, so they didn't know everything. Like my wife says, they knew a reprobated mystery. They knew some things. They didn't know the whole picture. And so... We're blessed that they didn't. I'm sad that the beloved son had to do what he did and that the father has to, had to have gone through all the things that he's gone through. But like it says, even when he's angry, when he's talking to his prophets, he says, but my hand is outreached still. These people are sacrificing to these false gods. They're doing all these things. The people that I set free, my hand is outreached still. He's angry, but his hand was still outreached. So uh, our father, 
I want you guys to get to know him. It's, it's something that's changed my life. I, I, I've never had a, a desire to study. I always wanted that desire, um, but it's experiencing his healing power, his, his the fact that he's listening to what we say. It's extremely powerful, and that's what got me asking more questions. When I found out he was listening, it's like, okay, you're listening to me, the creator of this firmament that I'm finding out is real, is listening to little me. Why? Why are you listening? I don't know, but I'm going to start asking questions. And he's listening to us, and it's it's been on my heart lately. Uh, hopefully somebody can will gain meaning from this or it'll hit home with somebody else is – I really think we need to listen to him as well. And that is extremely important because you think about people that you talk to and you share stuff with the people that listen to you. That's who you want to talk to. If somebody's ignoring you when you talk to them, or if they're just coming to you with their problems all the time, like fix this, fix this. I got this wrong with me. This is wrong. This is wrong. It wears you out. And I, I think a lot of times we come to the father like that, like this is what's wrong. Fix this, fix this, fix this. My, everything's a wreck, <laughs> you know? Listen, listen, what is he trying to tell me right now? What is he trying to tell me to do? What do I need to do? What's my next step? Father, t show me the way. And people that have done that have done wonders when they've stopped and they've listened. It was a back and forth conversation. And I'm guilty of having these one sided conversations where I'm, I'm just talking and I'm not listening. So whoever needs to hear that, we need to we need to um, definitely open our ears and listen. We've all had. Most of us have had our eyes opened, it feels like. We're waking up, and so we need to have our ears open. That's the final step. We need to be ready. Can't say that enough. I feel like he's called so many of us to help make people ready, and knowing what's to come is the only way we can help make people ready. If I don't know what's to come, I can't help make anybody ready. If I think we're in the little season and I'm trying to prepare people for Gog and Magog, then I can't get everybody ready. I need to know where we are in time, and it's important. If it's Gog and Magog or if it's Armageddon, both scenarios, they're trying to battle the most high. And as you can see with that Operation Steadfast Defender, they're rehearsing. And they're rehearsing um, to show that they can, like they said, destroy a near peer threat. And they're going to be very near to Armageddon when they're practicing. So this makes this makes sense to me as to where where we are in time being right there before that seventh millennial day. And I, again, like, like people tell me with this, pray about it. Uh, watch our generations of the heavens and the earth. I will try to um, put that in the description right away. Let me see if I can um, find that real quick in our studio under content generations of the heavens and the earth. I put together the presentation for a conference. And so, um, it helped me, helped me put everything together in a more concise way. It really challenged me. And so I will go to our live. I don't know if it'll let me do it now. Let's see if I can put it in the comments here. For anyone who's confused about the millennial day aspect, um, I think that's it. Let's hope that's it. I think I just shared it. I think I did. Let's see. I'll do it again just in case I didn't get it right. Copy the link. Yeah, JK is the last two. Interesting. So, yeah, there's the generations of the heavens and the earth that really, I mean, the spirit was moving me on that. When I would see these things, it was powerful how the first and second day of creation mimics the new first and second day that we're in. That blew my mind. Um, his spirit moving above the waters, you know, upon the waters. It's, it's a lot like that first day, Pentecost, that first millennial day after Yeshua, Pentecost, his spirit moving on the people. Like, it's just, there is a foreshadowing that the word is a roadmap. What he's left us is a roadmap that shows us where we are and what's to come. So I, it, it's it's fascinating. If anything, hopefully I can pique some of your interest into reading the Bible, understanding these things, looking at the prophets. It's it's a lot to go through, and I think you look at the Old Testament; it just seems so big. Uh, they don't want us looking at it because it's 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 a game changer, and that's why Peter, when he was saying, "Be mindful of the prophets," they didn't have a New Testament yet. He was telling them, "Be mindful of this. Look at what these prophets have been telling us." And understand that thousand years is as a day, and the day is a thousand years. Oh, look, look who we got. We got Fasuk Films finally getting distributed with their film. We got to come on soon or have them come on soon. Talk about all these things, all the major awards. And yeah, thank you, Skid Wister. Um, 
willingness to search this stuff out. Yeah, this is something we all need to do because it's growing. This topic is growing and um, it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to stay wrong and not listen to what the father's telling us. And if he's, and if I'm wrong, I want him to tell me you're wrong. You're misleading people. Stop teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Stop praying and saying that kingdom come, that will be done. It already came, you know, that sort of thing. Like it's a big deal. It is a huge deal. doesn't seem like it, it seemed innocent at first, but it seems like now it's really, really, really uh, changing. But yeah, thank you guys for joining in. I know your time is precious and valuable. Um, if there's anything you wanted to add or any questions you have, please ask. Um, I thank you guys for your support. We are in a pivotal time where decisions are about to be made on to what I'm going to be doing next year. And um, finding out about things like retirement. How is that going to affect my retirement if I step down from teaching? Um, you know, trying to make those trying to plan out the next year if I'm going to do creation standard and focus on that stuff full time. So pray for us on that. It's going to be a, a big change if I'm stepping out of a secure income and going into the unknown. Uh, so only the father knows I want to do his will. If he doesn't want me to do that and he wants me to focus on things like this and studying and teaching, I want to do what I'm supposed to do. I don't want to do something um, and just jump the gun. Yep. He said, some, I'm going to switch to Sean soon. I think Sean's doing a debate right now. I'm not sure what it's about, but I'm sure it's controversial too. Yeah. So I don't want to interfere with that. Um, he was doing something at seven, but I don't know if it was seven his time or seven hour time. Sean from Kingdom in Context. But yeah, lots of things to be divided about. Spend time with the Most High. If you're angry at us, step away. Go pray. I've had people go, man, I was angry. I was slandering you guys. And then I went and prayed and asked the Father to show me the truth. And man, I'm sorry. He's, he's convicted me right now. So um, if you're one of those people that's extremely angry right now, go away. Go pray. Uh, spend some time with the Most High. And it will it will make a difference. Uh, like I've said before, a long time ago, if you start to talk with him, it's going to change your life. If you start to walk with him, it's going to change the lives of others. And so, yeah, that um, that definitely sticks out in my mind as something that was shown to me years ago when I was walking and trying to talk with him and trying to find out how to walk with him. So I'll see you guys later. I love you guys. Sorry for the chaos, you know, where everything kind of... Um, was all over the place with my slides. I didn't have enough time to really fully organize the ending of it, but uh, hopefully we got some uh, some uh, things out there, some thoughts and some verses that you haven't thought of yet. And um, hopefully you can share some with us that we haven't thought of yet. So we appreciate you guys. We love you. The Father loves you. Again, thank you guys, your, our supporters. Those of you who are studying along with us, we really appreciate it. And the Father loves you. So we'll see you around real soon.